Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. Here on The Point of View on City TV, we get the right guests, ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. As you would notice, these are very interesting times. There's a big vetting going on. There's a Supreme Court case. But there are also some big issues coming up. Tonight, I'm dealing with two issues. Judgment debts are back on the front burner. Ghana has been awarded an arbitration, or we've lost an arbitration, where we are supposed to pay in excess of $134 million. We'll dig into that and find out what really happened. We also have another one looming. We've been sent a notice of arbitration to the tune of $55 million for another project. We'll get into all of that for you later. And of course, we have been following the vetting with some key analysis of the people who've gone in, what they've been asking, what they've said. You will see some nice analysis of that later on. Send us your views and thoughts on WhatsApp on the number on the screen. And also, if you are watching on any social media platform, please feel free to comment. We'll be right back. Everything seems to get a little more expensive this time of the year. But keeping your family entertained doesn't have to. <laughs> now you can get a GoTV decoder with one month of GoTV Plus for the new low price of 89 CDs. That's 24-7 access to your favorite local stars. The biggest names in the game, international movies, and plenty to keep the kids busy. It's a deal you can't afford to miss, so don't delay. Get the limited time offer today. GoTV. Love it. So welcome back to The Point of View. So we're going to do a couple of things tonight. We'll give you a quick overview of the first matter in which a company called GCGD or GPGC sent Ghana to arbitration and won an amount of about $134 million. We'll give you a quick overview of that here. Then we'll speak to John Jinapo, who at the time this was signed originally, he was a deputy minister of power and he's also a, a senior member of the uh, Parliament's Committee on Energy, would later on get into another issue. This involved a Chinese company, which was supposed to bring us um, an intelligent traffic management system. Again, we had some problems with them, and they've also sent us to arbitration. That hasn't been determined yet, but they are hoping to get $55 million from us. We'll deal with the Honorable or former Member of Parliament, who was the Chairman of the Finance Committee at the time, uh, Marquis Ebuyeboa, on that. But I just wanted to show you quickly where we've come from in terms of this particular judgment debt issue. And for that, what is the dispute about? This is a very important point because this company says sometime in 2015, government faced with Doomso. Remember when John Mama was president, we had a big Doomso crisis. We got this company, and this was not the only company. There were about 18 companies involved in this Doomso issue. Now, we got this company to... Fast track power generation. They were supposed to get some plants from Italy and bring those plants to Ghana. Well, the contract was signed, everything was going well. Now, they are saying that after a general election, and this is a very key point here, after a general election, that there was a, a change in the government's behavior towards them. So they're saying in the claim that following a general election in December 2016 and a change of government, the incoming government, which is the MPP government, concerned that the commitment. Uh, into the contract was going to cost us some financial loss or it was, we're going to spend too much money on it, decided to abrogate the contract. Now, they're basically saying that certain things the government of Ghana did prevented them from doing what they ought to have done in essentially fulfilling their side of the contract. So they are blaming the government of Ghana for not fulfilling certain conditions precedent, which led to them not being able to fulfill certain conditions. So that was the main issue. 
Now, look at it. They're saying that in November 2017, Minister for Energy reported to Parliament that the PPA committee had recommended that four PPAs with a combined capacity of 1.8 thousand megawatts be deferred. So there were, in all, about four plus three plus 11 power purchase agreements. Some be deferred, but 11 were to be completely terminated. One of the 11 is the GPGC contract. Now, the company is not happy. And they're basically asking for something to be done. And this was really in the arbitration that happened. What were the reliefs they were seeking? They're basically saying that the EPA that they abrogated was validly abrogated because the government of Ghana did not do the right thing. And they were saying that they wanted the arbitration to order the government to pay them the full value of the early termination of the contract. And that would go above $134 million. Dollars. They also said that the arbitration should order government of Ghana, that's us, or the people representing us, to pay all of the costs and expenses of the arbitration proceedings in addition to interest and a lot of things. So this was what the relief they sought. Now, what did the government of Ghana say in return? I'll just quickly run through this for you. The government of Ghana said no. The reason why we got here was not entirely our fault. These guys were supposed to do something they did not do. So the government of Ghana, in uh, their response to the charges put forward, or the, the accusations, or if you want to use the word, the claims by the, 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 the protagonists, essentially said, government of Ghana should rather get an early termination payment and counterclaim, and they give specific reasons for this. G government of Ghana did not agree with them, obviously. Now, the way an arbitration works is that you have one person appointed by the person who sends the matter, the other person appointed by the government of Ghana, and then a third person they jointly agree on. So an arbitration is not adversarial like uh, litigation, and it doesn't take that much time. Now, let me just jump quickly to what they concluded. I think that's the main point for today. What was the award? Now, essentially, after listening to this company, GPGC, and listen to the government of Ghana, they basically said that on the basis of the submissions, the EPA was validly terminated by GPGC on account of our repudiatory conduct. And therefore, we were ordered, you and I, GOG, to pay the full value of the early termination payment. The amount is written there, $134 million, together with interest thereon from November 12, 2018, to the date of payment accruing daily and compounded monthly at the rate of LIBOR for six months. We're also to pay over $300,000 in respect of the cost of the arbitration, together with another $3 million in respect of their legal representation. <laughs> A lot of money. So if you put all this together, it's getting close to $140 million. And they also dismissed our counterclaim. So basically, we didn't get anything from the arbitration. Now, let me show you quickly the people who are involved in this, and I'll speak to a key person joined all of this. So here are the main characters for the... Um, so this was the Minister for Energy at the time. It's called the Honorable Boatier Jaku. Of course, when the original idea came in 2015, this was Kwamna Donko. He was the Minister for Energy under Mahama. And then, of course, when the MPP took over, Boatier Jaku became the minister. I've, I've put these two people here for a reason. I'll explain later. But let me talk to Honorable John Jinapo. He's the member of parliament for Yape Kusou, and he also happens to be the uh, deputy minister of energy at the time that this was done. Honorable Jinapo, good evening. Thanks for joining us on The Point of View. Honorable John Jinapo, are you there? Good evening. Good evening, Dana. Can you hear me? I can hear you and see you. I like your background. You have a nice book behind you. <laughs> we do a lot of studies here. So. It's very important. So, look, from the perspective of the minority in parliament, how did we get to this $134 million arbitration award against us? What went wrong? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've done some calculation. It's actually more than 134. 134 is just the initial uh, cost. There is also an interest charge of about $18 million. There's another 3 million, another 3.3 .3 million. And so when you add all, you're hitting about 160 million. If you put all the figures together, because we are supposed to pay for the cost of litigation, 
You are supposed to pay all the experts that were brought on board. You are supposed to pay some accrued interest and some other related expenditure aside the 134. And so that's a huge amount uh, if you were to take Ghana's economy and the amount that we are paying into consideration. You asked the question, how did we get there? It's unfortunate. We shouldn't have gotten here in the first instance. Like you said, this is an agreement that was signed by my former minister, Dr. Donko. It went to cabinet, it went to parliament and received parliamentary approval. This plant is a 107 megawatt plant. The plant was supposed to provide power for only four years. After four years, we are done with them and then they go off. And so when the new administration took office, one would have thought that at least they would have engaged uh, their predecessors. And that's something that all of us must learn. I thought that at least Boche Jakun would have, in one way or the other, communicated with his predecessor or myself or Sir Tepe or any other person in order to determine the way forward. But surprisingly, what Mr. Boche Jakun did was to write a termination letter. I think that was in March 2018. Let me just confirm for you. No, 13th February 2018. And the reason for the termination was that, and if I may quote, the ministry has been informed by the Energy Commission that GPGC has still not obtained a license from the commission to engage in the business of commercial activity for the sale of electricity. GPGC therefore has no capacity to execute the EPA. Accordingly, the EPA is null and void for want of capacity. Then it goes further and says that, look, GPGC's breach of its obligations under the agreement led to the termination. Mm -hmm. So what the minister believed in was that GPGC had failed to perform, had failed to honor its side of the contractual obligation. And so he had the power to terminate the agreement and that we're not going to pay anything. Of course, like you said, GPCPC felt that that was not proper. And so they went to arbitration. And in arbitration, we also go with a representative. And in this case, I think Professor Fiajo. Professor Fiajo, yes. At the end of it, and that, and if you read the 194 page document, I've pulled over the whole 194 page document. If you go to page 171, paragraph 492, they make a clear revelation. And for me, that is the most important thing that the PPA committee, this is a committee that was established by government to advise the minister on how to deal with this so-called power purchase agreement, suggested that the actual development cost of the project mm -hmm. to date should be verified and used as a guide in negotiation for termination. So this is what the PPA committee suggested to the minister. Let's look at what the people have actually done. Have they done any work? Even if we don't want the plant, let's negotiate with them and pay. And they quote a figure. And that for me is critical. The committee calculated what it estimated the actual development cost to be and thus hope for a price of a negotiated termination amount of $18 million. This is in the document. Mm. This is in the document, $18 million. So if we had negotiated with them, mm and discussed it with them to come to a conclusion, we probably would have paid an amount of $18 million. Okay. Because of Mr. Boachia's decision to terminate, mm -hmm. today we are paying close to hundred and seventy. million. Let me come back to that, John. So if you go to paragraph 152 of the arbitration award, they said that in November 2017, the Minister of Energy reported to Parliament that the PPA committee you are referring to their report recommended that four of the PPAs with combined capacity of 1.8 thousand megawatts be deferred till 2018-2025, three with a combined capacity of 1.15 deferred to 2025, and 11 PPAs, of which this one is part of, be te terminated, of which the total is 2,808 megawatts. Question quickly to you for people who are interested is, why did the previous government enter into 18 different uh, power purchase agreements? I think that's an important question, right? Why 18? 
So the first thing is that was the total of the eight, and that's one. Two, which days are they supposed to deliver? And did some of them deliver? Because some of them, like we are saying, they predate even the NDC government. Some of them predate me as deputy minister. But they were not providing the power. And we were faced with a critical energy challenge. So what do you do? You hold on and wait till these 18 or so are able to come. And God knows when they will come. Or if you have GPGC, which can deliver 107 megawatts immediately, deploy that for four years whilst you take time to deal with the others. Mm. I think that that decision was a prudent decision. It was a good decision mm. that your economy was collapsing. Businesses were suffering. PPAs had been entered into some of them predating President I see. Obama. But the total, yet, no the, total the total amount of power the 18 PPAs would give us would be in excess of 5,700. That's just to give you an information. Now, the minister also told parliament that the government stood to make significant savings from the deferment or termination of the PPAs. In fact, he said that the cost for termination in total was $402 million compared to an average annual capacity cost of $586 million each year or a cumulative $7.6 billion. So in doing cost-benefit analysis, basically saying I could lose four hundred million dollars. That's false. That's false. But, but it's in the it's in the that arbitration claim. This is what the minister said to Parliament. So this is a direct quote from. Let me deal with this. This is a direct quote. Let me tell you why the minister. Let me tell you why the minister is misinforming us. This is an agreement for four years. Is that not it? So how do you lump four-year agreements and stretch them for fifteen years? You are comparing apples with oranges. That's not done in this sector. If you have a PPA for four years, you have to segregate that and tell me that over the four years, this is how much it will cost. Over the next seven years, this is how much it will cost. You must give me that segregation. But to take a four-year PPA and extend it and say that if I were to pay that amount for 15 years, mm. this is how much it will cost me. It's flawed. No, he was, making, a, he was making an Two, argument over the total. Just to get, he was talking about all the agreements. Not just this one with GPG. He says 500 per year. Yes. And if you extend that 500 to this number of years, it will cost this amount. And I'm saying it's wrong. And he's saying that's for all the 18 that. projects. That's for all the 18, not just this one. So let me, let me, let me, let me land. Then he says that he'll be making savings. Yes. He says that the savings is 400 million. He's terminated this agreement. Mm -hmm. And this agreement, we are not supposed to pay anything based on his understanding. Is that not the case? Yes. Because he terminated because he holds the position that GPG, GPGC did not fulfill their part of the contractual yes. obligation. Yes. As it stands now, it tells you that the minister was completely wrong because a higher court, much more powerful than the minister, has ruled against Ghana that instead of paying 18 million through negotiation, mm -hmm. we are going to pay over 160 million. So this minister's statement cannot stand the test of time. At least we've been vindicated. Another quick the result question to tells you. you that he was wrong after all. Another quick question to you. Was it just Minister Jaku involved? Or from what you know in Parliament, was Attorney General and Finance Ministry involved at any point? Because you do know that when it comes to PPAs, there's a strong legal side and there's also a strong finance side. And in fact, the announcement that Ghana had more power than it needed in terms of the PPAs was made by Mr. Kenoforiata. So my question to you is, in all your engagements, do you still feel this the ultimate responsibility is here or it, it was with um, the other two as well? We have a termination letter signed by this minister, Mr. Bocha Jaco. He signed the termination letter. He stated that it was unlawful. It turned out that he was wrong. If the attorney general advised him, fine, we will deal with that. If the Minister of Finance advised him as well, we would deal with that. But I'm saying that even in Parliament, we challenged these figures. And you heard us challenge the figures. Chairman Nesibe Yabua was then the chairman for the Finance Committee. When we requested for details for that 500 million, and I have the details here, it turned out that they were paying other unrelated expenditure, including fuel. So if you're paying for fuel, how do you describe that as capacity charge? 
what Mr. Kenoforata did was to just lump all payments together, including power that has been delivered, but that has not been paid by ECG, came to parliament and misrepresented, saying to us that he was paying 500 million due to capacity charges. And Mary has been available for more than 90%. So how do you tell me that you are paying capacity charges for Mary? Car power has been available for almost 90%. So if car power brings a bill to ECG, Mm. And ECG is unable to pay because of your own inefficiency. And the ministry steps in to pay. The ministry is not paying for capacity charge. Mm. It is paying for power that has been consumed. Fair enough. So even the truth, the truth is a matter. It's a key issue. Okay. What capacity are you talking of? I have a document from ECG here. And if I may just quote before you, mm -hmm. you end it. This is Electricity Company of Ghana. ECG's 2019 performance and work program for 2020. It was submitted to us in February 2020. If you go to page, just one moment, I want to always quote the pages. Page 19, key issues. ECG makes the claim that this 500 million is not true. Okay. And this ECG, that has to deal with these capacity charges. All right. Because all the plans are available. All right. The PPAs are with ECG. All right, Honorable Jinapo, we, we do know that we have to separate the legality of how government of Ghana treated this company with whether financially, and you are a, a, an accountant, the whole uh, PPAs were viable for Ghana. So I agree with you that obviously the arbitration award suggests that legally we did certain things wrong. But I looked through the original agreement, the, 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 the EPA, and some of the things I saw, for example, clause 13 talks about taxes. And it says, the government of Ghana shall obtain for the benefit of GPGC an exemption from all taxes imposed by any governmental authority of the Republic of Ghana to GPGC in accordance with the laws of Ghana during pre-construction, construction, and operation of the plant for the period of at least four years. And then he even says that in the event that GC, GPGC is required to pay any taxes in Ghana that are not covered by the tax adjustment or the tax exemption, if any, or which are incurred as a result of our failure to obtain or maintain a tax exemption, we shall reimburse them in United States dollars. For a Ghanaian watching some of the details of this agreement, why do you convince me that this, this was in the interest of Ghana? What you have to do is you read all the other PPAs. These are standard clauses. You see, it's a cost-benefit analysis, like you said. So if GPGC would buy fuel every month to power the plants, and we decide that we'll tax them for that fuel. All they do is to pass it as a pass-through to the consumer because fuel is a pass-through. So you must watch and analyze these things from an energy economics point of view. That, yes, the plant is here. They are supposed to do a construction. And bear in mind that construction cost will be factored into mm. the final tariffs to the consumer. If you decide that you want to tax them, no problem. You can tax them. But then they have to recoup that amount by passing it as a pass-through to the tariff. So if you want a very low tariff, then it means that some of the taxes mm. ought to be taken. I'm asking because I'm saying that you ought to. I'm, I'm asking packages. because you've come on this show before to complain about tax exemptions, and the, my emphasis is all taxes from all stages. This is not just the fuel side, which is why I'm asking. Because I remember you, you argued forcefully here for other agreements that we are giving too much tax exemption, and are you saying that when it comes yes. to this particular company, it's justified? So let me give you an example. One example was that hotel that is being built. What has that hotel to, got to do with ordinary Ghanaian? This is a private individual who is setting up his hotel to make profit for himself. So if you give him unfettered tax breaks, I will have a problem with that. But if you have a load shedding, if you have an energy challenge, and an energy plant is coming into the system, in order to resolve your productive capacity, you have a choice either to put those taxes on and pass it on to the consumer or deal with that. And don't also forget that this agreement went to parliament. I don't have any power as executive to waive taxes. The constitution is clear on that. You only make a proposal for tax waiver and take it to parliament. And I'm saying that this is standard practice with all power plants. All right. What are the taxes? The taxes are the equipment. We've listed them. And you just don't go and say that, give me tax waiver. You list all the items. Parliament will peruse them. If Parliament is certified that these taxes 
deserve those waivers, like the construction that you talked about, like the equipment that you talked about, then parliament will give that approval. So from an energy economics point of view, it makes economic sense to give those tax breaks so that your energy will be cheaper for industry and for consumers to have reliable source of power at an affordable price. Thank you, John Jinapo. We will talk about the Accra Intelligent Traffic Management later, but I thank you for your time. He is the uh, member of parliament for Yape Kusowu and, of course, a former deputy minister for the energy sector. This is still the point. When we come back, we'll delve into another issue. This time, the arbitration hasn't been finished, but we're told that a Chinese company called Everyway says it entered an agreement with the government of Ghana, procurement, installation, and construction, and they have started work, and the government of Ghana decided to stop the work they had started and give part of the contract to another company, being Huawei. They've served as a notice for arbitration, and they are claiming $55 million. I, I spoke to the former chairman of the finance committee, who is Marcus Ibebo, about this, and we'll come back with that. Later on, we'll take you into the betting. Some interesting statistics. This is the point of view. Don't go away. Energy drink keeps you going. Available in major supermarkets and shops near you. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advert is FDA approved. Let's take a moment to talk about money. Life can get a little pricey out there. The passing pleasure of a restaurant meal. A fleeting fast food feast. Or those sports magazines you never really finish. But what if you got to watch the big game rather than read about it? And what if that lasted a lot longer? Well, with DSTV, it can. Because with a whole range of different package options to choose from, you can get a whole month's worth of moments for both you and your family at a price you can afford. I am so excited. That's right. Only one in exchange for hours of sport, lifestyle, love is a game of cat and mouse, international, local, and kids entertainment. Let the nerds take over. It's your moment to enjoy all the moments with DSTV. Welcome back to The Point of View. First part of the show, we're looking at Ghana's looming judgment debt. There are a few others. We understand there's another one with GCNet, but we don't have all the details, so we won't get into that. But this one is a Beijing-based construction company. It's called Everyway. They entered an engineering procurement installation and construction contract with the government of Ghana's Ministry of Roads and Highways. In 2012, they were to design and build the Accra Intelligent Traffic Management System project and to supply equipment for the purpose. This was to have CCTV cameras, automatic number plate recognition, to catch traffic violators with a loan from CDB Bank. Now, in 2018, Parliament approved the contract, came into effect in July 2019. But in November 2020, Ghana rescinded on its approval of the contract and approved a new contract for the completion of the project with two other Chinese contractors, Huawei Technologies and China National Import and Export Corporation. Now, one of the reasons why the government of Ghana uh, reversed the original approval and approved this new contract was that they said that uh, on the basis of background checks conducted on Everyway, which is the Chinese company, by the Ministry of National Security, the company, Everyway's reputation had been called into question and suggested that it lacked overseas experience and manpower to carry out the project. Now, this point was made at the time by Marcus Ibeboa. I called him up earlier on the, on the radio 
for him to justify why they did this. Here's an excerpt of that interview. In, the, in that master facility agreement, there were 12 subsidiary agreements. And so one of it was the Sinopec contract, which built the Ghana gas infrastructure at Atuabo. And then we had a Huawei. Um, I, 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 I heard your yes. colleague speak about the Huawei one. Mm -hmm. Now, each subsidiary agreement is supposed to come to parliament. So following the MPPs uh, coming to power, they renewed the CDB facility. And then now there is the building of the um, face landing sites, 12 of them. So that one was approved. Now, consequentially, we had to approve the Accra Intelligence Traffic Management System, which we did. Parliament approved it in 2018. Essentially, what that contract does is to uh, manage the traffic situation so that in the morning, if there's traffic built up around 37, there's a, a system that says that, okay, divert traffic through here or there or wherever. So that's what this uh, entailed. And Parliament gave us uh, approval. Subsequently, the contract was to be executed. What I know is the Ministry of Finance then writes to CDB that they were not going to go ahead with the signing of that contract. But prior to that, uh, Beijing every every week company had imported the uh, uh, equipment and materials they needed for the contract. All that remained. This had gone through parliament, cabinet, parliament, AGs, and so all that remained was for finance to execute the contract. It didn't happen, but they also went ahead and started implementing this under the, uh, an agreement with the Ministry of Roads and Highways, Ministry of Roads, because traffic uh, management. Then comes in national security in the latter part of 2020, and they, they say uh, they were saying that this would be a duplication. But amongst the, some of the reasons they advanced, they said the directors of Beijing everywhere in China had been convicted of some corruption. They thought that this was a company that they wanted Ghana to deal with. And so those quotations uh, attributed to me were facts presented to the committee, which were captured in my report. And so they rescinded, Parliament rescinded the earlier decision on account of the submissions made by the Ministry of National Security that now we have to hive this one up from transport, take it to national security for Huawei to implement this under the earlier approval that I got. As to whether these two contracts do the same thing, I'm not, uh, I, I cannot uh, pronounce on that, but this is how, how, how I have been involved uh, with this one. So when the Beijing, when the Huawei came in, did Parliament approve the Huawei bit as well? Okay, so uh, let me give this distinction. So the CDB master facility had already been approved um, in 2011. That's the three billion. Each subsidiary agreement, the financing agreement comes to the finance committee. So the financing, if it's hundred million, we approve that. And so you remember I brought in uh, roads and highways. So for the Accra Intelligence Traffic Management System, the contract went to the subcommittee on uh, the parliamentary committee on roads and highways. So roads and transport. So they, they approved that commercial contract. But the financing agreement had already been approved. So the subsequent change to national security, what it entailed was that now the original contract was annulled and now the new one went to the committee on defense and interior. But our approval at the Finance Committee of the Financing Agreement stood because that, that's the financing bit. But the nitty of what this entailed went to the Committee on Defense and Interior. I see. So you depended on the national security information that, in addition to everything you said, background checks conducted on the everyday or some of their directors revealed that some of them had also some questionable background. And therefore, you, you approved the termination of the everyway contract so the the, the whole house uh, rescinded its decision you answer because the earlier decision would have meant that there, there are two contract subsistence which would be the uh, contract with the ministry of roads and highways and then secondly the contract now with the ministry of defense and Interior. so it was the honorable inusa Hussaini, when parliament was about to approve the commercial contract between national security, and Huawei, who drew the attention of the House to the fact that if we're going to go ahead with that one, then we, Parliament needs to rescind its earlier decision that was uh, given between the Ministry of Roads and Highways and uh, Beijing everywhere. So Parliament 
then rescinded this uh, that one before going ahead uh, to approve mm. the new contract between National Security and, mm. uh, and Huawei and the uh, second partner. Mind you, this time around, then Huawei, the Ministry of National Security, also comes for a tax waiver. I think it's about $25 million. So that tax waiver again came to us, and we had to approve. And so we even held on for the uh, Defense and Interior Committee to approve the new agreement before we also gave our approval uh, uh, of the tax waiver. That was Marcus Ebeboa, who is a former member of parliament for New Job in South and also the former chairman of the Finance Committee. Now, don't forget that uh, I did this interview earlier. I still have John Jinapo on the, on the line. Just another quick thought on this. Honorable Jinapo, I believe you're on the Finance Committee, are you not? Yeah, I am. You are, you are a chartered accountant at that. He just narrated how this matter came up. We understand every way has served arbitration notice. So obviously, it's also going to arbitration. Do you, how do you see this ending, this particular one, this um, uh, intelligent traffic conversation? Well, I wish Ghana all the best. But clearly, if you look at what transpired, we should be prepared for another massive one. Because you had parliamentary approval, both Finance Committee and the Roads and Highways Committee approved it. Based on that, this company went ahead to import equipment before they clear the equipment, they normally go through the processes. So at least some work has been done. Why can't we negotiate when we want to terminate? I mean, it's, it's simple. At least pursue that option first, negotiate and see if you can come to an amicable solution. If negotiation fails mm -hmm. and you are pursuing the other option, that even makes a bit of sense. But why this rush to terminate terminate only to go to the International Court of Arbitration and pay huge sums of money. John, I mean, this is unfair. John, this one is, the difference between this one and the previous one was that whereas in the previous one, it was the NDC that started the process fully and the new government came to take over. What baffles me about this, this one is that even though NDC originated this one, in 2018, an MPP-led parliament sort of ratified and started the project. And then in 2019, they reversed that, claiming national security issues. I mean, what did your side say? Because I, I remember him saying, for example, that Inu Safusani advised them that if you're going to sign a new contract, you need to terminate the old one. Was, it, was your side against this or it escaped you? Yes, we raised it at the committee level. Inu Inusa even advised them that, look, if parliament approves this contract, it means that we are approving two contracts at the same time. That is when it dawned on them that they even needed a recession. So I've been issue, somebody just wanted to terminate this contract. That is what it tells you, that somebody, and you see, I'm live on TV, your program is a respected respected program, so I don't want to say certain things that I, knew, I know privately. But I'm telling you that it's a wrong decision. A company that has already imported equipment, a company that is already in the process of implementing the contract, even if there are challenges, why don't you write to them? Caution them, let it be on record that you wrote to them. You are missing the deadlines. We give you a deadline of up to this date. If you're unable to perform, we proceed to terminate. Then there's some documentary evidence that can back your action. But as it stands, I am a Ghanaian and patriotic. I hope that Ghana wins this case. But looking at what transpired, I'm very, very worried. I'm really worried about what between roads ministry, finance ministry, and national security ministry. Who should take the greater responsibility for this? A higher authority, I can tell you for that fact. A higher authority than all three, a higher authority, a higher authority than these ministers. Really, should take the ultimate response. Yes, yes, a higher authority. Thank you for talking to us. We wish you well. <laughs> that was John Jinapo. He's a uh, uh, a former deputy minister for energy. I wanted to ask him about his brother's vetting, but we'll wait till the vetting later. So we'll leave him here. When we come back, we will show you what we've been doing with the vetting. Now, some of the vettings take place for long hours. In fact, it starts around 10, 30 in the morning. In fact, today's vetting, the first one took about six hours. We know you don't have six hours to watch television or listen to the radio. So we're going to give you 
bite-sized chunks of the vetting in a way never seen. The team that's been working on this in the digital setting will join me to explain how you can fill the vetting. Now, some very interesting statistics. Who asks the most questions? What kind of questions are asked? What areas of questions are asked? How long do they spend? And all of those things. We're going to review the vetting. About seven or so ministers have already been vetted from the Minister nominee for Health all the way to local government. More of that when we come back. This is still the point of view. Stay with us. Good Day Energy Drink keeps you going. Available in major supermarkets and shops near you. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women and people sensitive to caffeine. This advert is FDA approved. Because you know more than one angle and see more than one opportunity, we bring you Build a Bet. Multiple legs as a single bet on one game. Raising the odds and elevating your experience. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Bet responsibly, not for persons below 18 years. Welcome back to The Point of View. Lots of interesting things happening at the same time. We just finished talking about judgment debts. Now I want to take you into the vetting. I'm bringing Philip Kofi Ashong. He's my vetting man. He's the head of uh, digital media. To do a quick analysis of the vetting so far. Um, when did the vetting start? Last week? It started last week. Yes, it started in earnest last week. And quite a number of uh, ministers, ministers minister designates have been through the vetting process. So we just want to give um, viewers at home a sense of what has been happening because like you said it's it's almost what over six seven eight hours of vetting mm. you know the the members of parliament take 15 minute breaks between but we're trying to compress all of that into information or bite-sized information that people can easily understand and and work with because so hey, if you can't sit for six hours for example like so what, what is this madame esther so this is basically something that one of the things that we try to do whereby we break down some of the key issues and some of the key statistics that we, um, we sort of glean from the vetting process. The vetting. So this, for example, is something that we put out a couple of minutes ago about Madame Esther Ousio Kufu's vetting. vetting process. So as you can see there, in the top corner there, she spent six hours. Six hours. With a vetting committee. Yes, indeed. And six hours. questions asked by my majority was 25. Wow. And minority put to her 57 Questions just to put everything so in into total, context 82 there. Questions, questions that were put to um, six hours. Well, and, and so, you have the there. time spent, the question the, the breakdown, question breakdown. And, then what is and then also, we have the top issues. Okay, so every um, you know, minister designate has some key issues that quite a number of the members of the panel put to them. For Madame Esso, Uso Kufu, she had Kelney. T, um, GVG. GVG as one of the key issues that were put to her. Quite a number mm -hmm. of the members of the panel actually put those to her. Mm -hmm. The closure of radio stations, oh, like, you know, one person asks and then someone comes back to ask as a follow-up and other things. Cybersecurity was yeah. also very 
key um, in, her, uh, in her analysis today. And of course, mobile network connectivity challenges also came up pretty prominently um, mm -hmm. throughout the vetting. Okay, so this is quite easy to follow. Yes, the, the most questions asked by my minority, Mubarak uh, Muta, Mutaka, mm -hmm. and he seems to be, to be leading for quite a number of Which is interesting ministers. because in a few other cases, Haruna Asmo, I think because Haruna used to occupy this position as communication minister, he probably has a bit of soft spot. So he, he is the, is the terror, terror guy. And indeed, and, and of course, um, John, John Kuma. Kuma also had five questions. What does this show us? So over here, we have a breakdown in terms of the percentages or, you know, basically giving you a pie chart wow. visualization of where and which issues sort of took um, center stage. So let's look at this. So as you can see here. Kelny GVG. Kelny GVG. Almost 20%. In the clear lead, almost 20%. Followed by the closure, closure of radio stations, which um, about 13.8% of the questions went to. Then, of course, you have the mobile network connectivity also mm -hmm. coming up 9.7%. Mm -hmm. And then the cost of internet data, which, you know, quite a number of people have been complaining about, mm -hmm. also came up around 6.9% of There's the total There's even COVID tracker, questions. SIM card registration. All these, but you can see most of these don't occupy so much. But then the county DVG, the closure mm -hmm. of radio stations, the mobile network connectivity seem to be okay. some of the what biggest What about people issues. who are looking for sound bites? What, what, where, where can they get that so from? So what typically happens is we know people want to get into the meat of it. So mm. um, what we try to do is to put some of these into these infographics for um, people to be able to access on their mobile devices. Mm. So this is one of the issues that was raised about the Kelny DVG. Wow. And um, as always, she, says what? Know, she said she will sign the deal all over again if she had a chance wow. to. If I had to do this all over again, I would. Earlier, wow. I started talking about all the benefits the country had, to, had got from the county GVG deal, and I didn't even go through half of it. Wow. So she basically just pointed out that she would do it all over face. again if she had to. I mean, there were a few naughty um, issues that, you know, she had to navigate, wow. but then she did a pretty good job with it. Government didn't pay for COVID-19 tracker app. This issue okay. came up... Um, hugely last year, and she kept insisting that, you know, governments basically had it. This is, a, this is a big one, because a lot of people were saying that the app was not effective, there was a lot of money, or they assume it was a huge amount spent because there was, I think, big artists, it was live on TV, TV and lots so of quite adverts. An amount of money went into so it. So private people paid for it? She, she indicates that private people actually did pay for it, and she insisted, there were quite a number of questions around this, but she, she, she okay. stood her ground on this. Another one had to do with the shutting down of the yeah, radio this stations. Yeah, this was big. You know, so this, this is one of the quotes, for example, from what she said. Following the FM audit, the National Communication Authority has observed increased regularity compliance from FM stations in Ghana. Just to buttress her point um, about, you know, mm. the shutting down of radio stations and how it has yeah. increased regulatory You know what's, what I find interesting? She's a member of the committee, mm. and usually parliaments are certain things they do. So, for example, when the majority leader came, mm. they spent less than an hour. He's a member of our team. Okay. So I'm surprised that a member of the committee mm. was grilled for six hours. I think also because of a number of things that happened in parliament prior to the vetting. For example, on the night when the crossover was happening. <laughs> the chair sitting. And the chair sitting and everything else. You can clearly tell that quite a number of um, the members of okay. the house had issues with her. But, hey. Okay. These We've been discussing energy today. Yes, and so, so this uh, this is Napo. This he was is, vetted last week. Exactly. So as you can see, that he spent twelve hours, no, two hours and twelve minutes. That's pretty cool. Had uh, uh, eleven questions from the majority, and of course, the minority will always be in the lead with a number of questions. So that's 40, 43 questions. Forty-three questions. Esla is doing eighty-two questions, and then he's doing. 42. So you can clearly tell also with the time spent, you know, yeah. with them as yes, well. Yes, it does work. And um, top issues: renewable energy, energy sector, and of course, allegations against John Mahama. PDS is there. And Nano Pukwajiman, which um, came up prominently. But then energy as you can sector see, debt. energy sector debt and everything. And so, as always, you'd always get the mm -hmm. question areas for all the ministers. Mm -hmm. So you have the question areas being renewable energy. Um, the main areas, renewable energy, taking about 19.4% of the questions. SHS issues, considering the fact that he had just come... Okay, but I was from, going to ask what is education yeah, doing there. He, had just, he was the minister former for education. minister of education, so, so it's, it's, it's in line with that. Allegations against Mahama, hey, about 13.4%. 13 13 the NDC guys are not joking. You know, they needed an apology from him. And, Did um, they, they get it? They got some... They got, got an apology. An apology. They couldn't get an apology from Esla on the point 
Because there was a point uh, the minority made about something she said about them. Them, exactly. She, they didn't get an apology, well, but they got an apology from him. They did get an apology from him. Okay. And then, of course, the PEDS deal also came up prominently during um, the vetting of the energy minister. There's so, some other ministers. So hold on. Usually, the leadership would... This is the uh, major, minority leader. This is the ranking, ranking member. Ranking member, yeah. No, this is actually the chief whip. So yeah, the leadership will ask more questions. More questions. But then as you can see, Haruna, how they're leading the pack. But one individual who basically took center stage. The record last holder. Week, the record holder for the most time spent wow. is, of course, Godfrey Dami. Uh, six Dami six for hours, six, six minutes. minutes. I was actually thinking And that's that 94 questions. Esla yes. had 82. 94 I was thinking questions. that Esla might beat him, but hey, he still holds the record for six hours, six minutes of vetting. And he did he 71 did good questions job. by the minority. Yes, indeed. And wow. as, as, as always, Ijapa, the Ijapa deal took wow. a bunch of it. 45.5% of the questions wow. were related to the Ijapa royalties deal and the PPA scandal as well, as well as the botched PDS deal also came up. So, as as always, Haruna Idrisu... 26 um, questions from Haruna Idrisu. And um, Alexander Fenyo marking, of course, with eight is questions. The, uh, deputy majority, majority leader. leader. So, looking at the breakdown... So, you can see the Ijapa, uh, Ijapa deal, 45% PPA. there. And then um, the Public Procurement Authority scandal um, issues coming up there, 18.2%. Hmm. Legal education, that's interesting, 9%. I mean, he is occupying, and there were there have been a number of issues from last year and mm. two years ago about you know legal education, and so quite a number of questions had to be wow. in, in that. And like we said, nine point one percent of the questions were on the PDS deal alone. Incredible. So you've done uh, so six hours. This is a record holder. This is the record holder. I I doubt anybody would overcome okay. this particular one there. And but this this is, is the ever popular. A lot of people's a lot favorite. Of people, you know, were minister. very interested. Just two twenty. In Napo was two twelve. Yes. So, I mean, a lot of people really enjoyed his session, talking about the positives from his, um, his, his question time. And the top issues for him... Not too many questions, 13, 13 26. You know, and I mean, when you spend two hours, 20 minutes, you wouldn't expect that many questions. But then the top issues, impact of COVID-19 on schools seem to be um, a big issue among, you know, mm. the, the members of the panel. Mm. Financing of tertiary education also came out very prominently yeah. during his vetting. Don't forget that the Mahama Yariga had proposed that government should cater for the school fees of university students. Right. And he, on the floor of parliament, opposed that. Right. So there was a bit of discussion on this. On that. And of course, then leading to the public universities bill, which mm. you know, came out prominently last year, that was also um, taking center stage there. And then access and affordability of basic education, the mm. definition of it and all of that. But I'm surprised that as well. with how education has become a major issue in Ghana, I didn't spend more time. Is it because mm. they liked him? Because, I mean, it seems as if if they like you, they don't you spend a lot, a, a, a little, less time. Because a, 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 education a, a, is so big. Yes. Schools have been closed for, for, for long. Free SHS is big. Double track system. Universities issues, public universities, but to spend only two hours, 20 minutes, and you compare that to six, six hours, hours. Six, I mean, and even, it, even and Napo is almost, this is And I think it also, it also depends on the disposition of you wow. know, the, the minister designates. Because oh, when, God. for example, um, Madame Esso came up today, one of the issues had to do you know, with you know, the way she, um, her disposition towards you know, answering questions or some of the things that she said in the past. And quite a number of people members of the panel kept going back to that same issue. With him, his answers were pretty straightforward. You wouldn't get most people going back too much with regards to that. And the way he answers the questions also... So that, but I just you know, suggest that people at, at the, ease. some of the pursuits of the committee is not necessarily in our interest, but their own personal issues. Because if... I mean, I don't know. Because I think education is such a major issue. Right. And it affects so many people. I think, I think it more has to do with the disposition of the personality who is okay. going to take the role. Than the, the, than, than the, the issues. Than the, 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 the issues so what were the key... So for, for this one, um, we actually did a different kind of breakdown where we looked at the question areas generally. Okay. So 4% of the questions were based on past statements that he'd made okay. and a review of those. Assurances that he made, for example, during the vetting took about 12% So they usually the would say to you... We know that this is a problem. Will you assure us, us that you will do this so they can hold you to it? Exactly. So that's twelve percent. And then issues concerning the manifesto promises as well took about eight percent of the time during um, the vetting. Thirty-two 
percent were running issues having to do with education generally. And that's where you find the public universities bill, for example, coming um, center stage. That's where you find the impact of COVID-19 on schools also coming into play. 8% of the questions had to do with personal issues having to do with himself. And then comments and amendments by mm. various you know, personalities also took about 24% wow. of it. He, they spent about 12% 12, 12 on his CV alone. Seriously. 12% of the questions were focused on his CV alone. I want to end with Esla because I think her slide, she's the latest minister to have invested. I just want this to sink in. This is mm. awesome. Six hours. And so many different issues. You wow. can see the breakdown is, is, is wow. quite this diverse. Is, this is... This is because, I mean, her, her ministry, and now that digitalization has been incorporated into her ministry, it, mm. it, you know, it opens it up a bit in terms of, and especially issues like cybersecurity will come mm. um, to the, to the so fore with will, regards will to the ministry. So the technology journalists review her vetting? I will absolutely review Because today, a very interesting point came up during the show where she distinguished between digitization mm -hmm. And digitalization. digitalization. She educated somebody it's, on the comment. I thought that was, that was brilliant. It's, 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 very, it's very good. But, I mean, for me, one of the key issues has to do with some of the mobile apps that have been outdoored and exactly how they're doing. Because the questions about, for example, the COVID-19 tracker app, what, what exactly is happening to it? Are we going to make headway with it? These are some of the issues that uh, we're hoping to get to the bottom of. She did answer some of them as we saw in the slide. The COVID uh, tracker. The COVID tracker being paid for by, you know, uh, individuals. We didn't pay uh, anything for the app. For, we, we absolutely didn't. That is her, mm. her position, has always been her position. But mm. there are other questions that need to be asked. For example, where and who has access to the information? Who is keeping the information? Um, you know, the security of the information, for example, about you that you input into the app, where does it go? There are quite a number of questions that need to be explored. So as a technology journalist, it's, these are some of the questions that I'll be looking at exploring, you know, in the coming weeks. But I think she did a fantastic job concerning, considering the fact that she sat there for almost six hours six being hours. grilled by the members of the panel. I think she did a pretty excellent so job. So where can we get this for those who are not watching or probably don't have time. Where well, would they get this information? Well, all this information is available on a number of our platforms. So you can visit citynewsroom.com, which is our website where you can get all of these news stories as and when they happen. You can visit our various social media platforms as well. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and you can find all of this information there as well. On YouTube, in case you want to catch up on some of the vetting as well, you can Do you have some um, city tube to video get, video bits of the nice things. Yes, indeed. So um, quite apart from the infographs that we do and the stories that we do, we have short videos of some of the key issues that came up. Nice. So, um, for example, the issues having to do with Madame Esla and the back and forth with some of the mm. members of the panel, you can get access to this. And we make wow. all of these available on all our social media platforms. Just search for City FM, City 97.3. Or City TV G. Or the hashtag is hashtag is GH vetting. Wow. GH vetting. You're able to get access to all of this. And so much more. I think this is really nice. This is really cool. Um, if you don't have time to follow the vetting, I think this is you can impress your friends, send this to them. <laughs> and we have Philip Kofi Ashong, head of New Media City, leading a team of intelligent journalists to make sense of the vetting. This is very important. Now, we wish we could go on, but we have to end the show here. We started off by discussing the judgment debts that we've incurred, $134 million. We spoke to John Ginapo. We also spoke about a looming judgment debt. Of course, an arbitration notice. We don't know if we're going to win. We pray we win. If we lose, we'll pay $55 million to every way Chinese company. Then we also then went into the vetting. Mm -hmm. Don't forget the hashtag is GH vetting. I hope you can come again uh, next time. I look forward to it. Okay. I mean, considering how today has gone, I, I really look forward to discussing more about the vetting. Amazing. Thank you so much for watching today's edition of The Point of View. My name is Bernard Avalet. We'll be with you next time. Stay with City TV. Bye-bye.